Hi guys, I'm Mr. Kane. Good to see you again. Hi, I'm Mrs. Goswish. Nice to see you again too. But there's a message back there if you can if you can read that. You'll get it. All right. So, uh, unit three: atomic theory and protons, neutrons, and electrons. Is that how we read that? What are the things in the upper right-hand corner? What does that mean? Uh, I mean, I get the symbol. Uh, that's that. They see, this is a plus, and that's a zero, and that's a negative. So does that mean the protons are positively charged? Zero. I'm positive about that, actually. Positive? <laughs> I'm positively positive. <laughs> well, all right, I get the positive by uh, the protons. No, I, I don't know anything here. Uh, does that mean no charge? Is that possible? There's an entity, a particle with no charge? Cash only on Cash that Cash only, <laughs> no charge. And the electron has a little negative sign? No friends for the electron, too negative. All right, unit three goals, chemical foundations. You are going to be able to draw, describe, identify, and explain each of the historic models of the atom. That is going to include, but not limited to, Democritus, Aristotle, Plato, Dalton, Thompson, Rutherford, Chadwick, Millikan. You are also going to be able to determine the number of protons, electrons and neutrons in atoms, ions, and isotopes. Okay, so brief history of atomic theory. Uh, it turns out that atomic theory starts as far back as 600, B 600 BCE, before the Common Era, in India. But uh, that's non-Western Civ, and here in the United States and in Europe, we tend to study s Western Civ only, not non-Western, so we say it's as early as 400 BCE. All right, now, Mr. Kane, I'm a little older than you, and I don't know all the new terminology. Tell me what BCE means again? BCE is before Common Era. Is that the new way of saying before Christ? Yeah, it's, the, the, it's the politically correct. For, yeah. Oh, for the non-religious, politically it's, it's correct still, people. It's still, right. it, uh, we still have use zero as all the right. I or, get it. origin. All right, so as early as 400 years before Christ, Democritus is a Greek philosopher scientist who comes up with this idea that if you start cutting things apart, you cut something in half, let's say you take an orange and you cut it in half, and you cut it in half again, and you cut it in half again, you just keep cutting it in half, he comes up with this idea that at some point you're only going to be able to divide this orange so many times, and you're going to get to a piece of orange that's not divisible anymore, you can't cut it in half anymore, and he calls this idea atomos, which uh, in Greek means indivisible. This is actually Democritus here. Basically what he is, he's the first person in the Western world that describes particles that are finitely divisible, divisible which we now call atoms. I don't know why we call them atoms. It, I don't know why we call them atoms mm, at all. Using the terminology to your advantage, isn't yeah. that amazing? It's, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, the reason why you've probably never heard of Democritus, though, is because there were two other philosopher scientists at the time called Aristotle and Plato. Plato didn't play nice, did he? No, they didn't. Uh, they, they wound up being uh, better liked uh, philosopher scientists because some of their ideas were just better, better liked by the population. And uh, they believed in the four core elements. They believed absolutely everything was made of earth, air, fire, and water. So if you divided things up, into smaller pieces, eventually you'd get pieces of earth, air, fire, and water, not individual pieces of orange. Basically what this led to was something that we call alchemy. Uh, and Aristotle and Plato won out, and alchemy ruled for 2,000 years. Wasn't alchemy the science of making gold? Yeah, one of, uh, one of, the, uh, one of the tricks to alchemy was they were trying to uh, discover how to make gold out of base metals like lead. <laughs> We fast forward 2,000 years to about 1808 where the f when the first real chemical uh, science is being done and there were three uh, important laws. We'll describe each of these three important laws here in just a moment. We got the law of definite proportions, the law of conservation of mass, and the law of multiple proportions. Law, law of definite proportions. A given compound will always be made of the same proportions of elements. Ethylene glycol is C2H6O2, always. Any sample of ethylene glycol will be two carbons, six hydrogens, and two oxygens. And uh, the way that we originally knew this was that it was always 51.56% oxygen, 38.70% carbon, and 9.74% hydrogen, because we didn't know anything about atoms at the time. So if I have 20 grams of the ethylene glycol, 
I could multiply 20 grams by that 51.56 and figure out what mass of oxygen is in? It seems reasonable, yeah. Ooh, okay. So 0.5156 times 20. Yep. Okay. Uh, sodium chloride uh, wound up is NaCl. It's 60.66% chlorine and 39.44% sodium. And it's always, always that. It's definitely always 60.66% chlorine and definitely always 39.44% sodium. No matter how much the sample you have. If you have one gram or two grams or 3,000 grams, 60% of the sample will be chlorine, 39% will be sodium. There you go. That okay. is the law of definite proportions. And I definitely get that. Good. It's proportional. So the, law, so the law of conservation of mass is actually a pretty cool one, and I think we're going to do this demo in class on, uh, on Tuesday. We're going to try. We're going to do this one. Uh, but basically, uh, this, is the, this, is, this is a law that says that the mass of the reactants must equal the mass of the products. Basically, you cannot destroy any of the mass when you do a chemical reaction. So if you have a sealed up flask that you've got two different solutions in, and you make them react, you're going to wind up, if you here, uh, you're going to wind up with the same mass after as you had before. Law of multiple proportions. For elements that form multiple compounds, the ratio of masses of the second element will always come out as a ratio of small whole numbers. This is the third law of Dalton's, and it's technically the... Mrs. G, this, is, this one just makes my head hurt. I know. It's kind of the ugly cousin. We don't come across it much, but you really have to know the definition of it and that it exists. John Dalton, and he's sitting there doing some thinking, just like good school teachers do. Is he sitting in the pub? Uh, definitely not. <laughs> well, it looks like he's sitting at his desk. In 1808, this guy John Dalton, uh, who's an English school teacher, realizes that the Greek idea of atomos and these three laws can be combined together to actually form some sort of a theory about atoms. Uh, and that's exactly what he does. Does he actually makes his name by taking other people's stuff? An English teacher does stuff. it. Yeah, an English oh, teacher. Oh heavens! Well, he he's a by by saying he's an English school teacher. What we mean is he's British. Oh, okay. I thought you meant literally English. So he's across the pond. He actually taught natural philosophy, which was in 1808 the the, the code word for science. Oh, natural philosophy. okay. I so what Dalton comes up with is he comes up with the fact that elements are one kind of atom. He comes up with the idea that compounds are made of two or more kinds of atoms and only um, only whole atoms can form compounds and only whole you can't split an atom in half is one of the things that he and atoms are spherical and very small and that's that this is what his model actually uh, talks about here along with his model he comes up with five principles the very first principle all matters made of small particles called atoms that can't be subdivided, created, or destroyed. So you got a Democritus's idea right there in the first okay. statement. All atoms of an element have identical physical and chemical properties, and elements are made up of one atom, and those atoms have the same physical chemical properties. Okay, get it. So yeah, one atom of gold is going to act like another atom yep. of gold. Every atom All of right. gold acts like an atom of gold. Different types of elements are made of different types of atoms. So that makes sense. And a gold atom is not made up of silver atoms. It's either gold or silver, yeah? Is that yeah, what that's, that's what saying? That's right. So, so there's different types of atoms. So a sample of gold is all gold and a sample of silver is all silver. And a sample of uh, a sample of gold atoms will look different than a sample of silver atoms. Okay. The, the actual atoms look different. I think that's, that's one of the points here. Uh, atoms are going to combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. There's the law of, uh, of proportions there. Okay. And then in chemical reactions, atoms are combined, separated, or rearranged, but are never created, changed, or destroyed. So there's uh, the law of conservation of mass. Right. Miss G, why are two of, these, two of these red and three of these brown? Well, I think, Mr. Kane, with the advent of technology and better equipment, I get the feeling some of Dalton's principles will not make it into the next century. Yeah. Uh, now, the importance of Dalton's theory, uh, why, uh, since we know that parts of it are wrong, why is it that we t talk about it? Well. It explains all the chemical data that existed at the time. He develops models of atoms, and this is actually uh, a drawing out of his book of, of elements. And he, he actually shows the his models are spherical, round spheres, and he, he actually symbol, comes up with some symbols for them. 
He's got things like lime and soda and potash, which I don't actually remember seeing those on the periodic table. Some of his elements were not real elements, although some of them are. But he, I see phosphorus. Yeah, yeah. And here's hard hydrogen, here's carbon and yeah. oxygen and phosphorus. He's, he's got, he's got a lot of good ones wrong. here. And he gave us proportions for molecules. So he, get, he came up with the idea that nitrogen dioxide, NO2, is always one nitrogen and two oxygen atoms. Uh, so we don't have to talk about his percentages anymore. Yeah. We can now talk about it as atoms, because uh, so, that was getting confusing. Sodium chloride is 66% sodium and 30-some-odd uh, percent. Uh, well, percent composition will be in handy when the next couple of in the next couple of units. We'll, we'll but for right that. now, it's two, just a two-to-one ratio. It's amazing how things come back around. Everything comes back around. J.J. Thompson comes along. Uh, he's the next big scientist, and he's... Uh, <laughs> now, does this mean he's British? Uh, he's an English physicist, so he studies physics in English. How about okay. that? Okay, <laughs> all right, I'll go with that. I like that. He wasn't studying the atom specifically. Uh, he was studying current. He was studying electricity. Okay. And he was using this device called a cathode ray tube. And if you look here, you can actually see that he's sitting next to his cathode ray tube, and you can see two wires coming off of it right here. Uh, our cathode ray tube that we have in class doesn't quite look like that. It looks a little bit more like this. Uh, it's a glass tube. Uh, and what's inside of it? It's a vacuum, isn't it? Yeah, so a vacuum. What's Meaning inside of a vacuum? There's nothing. Oh, yeah, no, that's right. So, empty. All right, so it's empty on the inside. There's absolutely nothing on the inside here. And they call it a cathode ray tube because one end of it is called a cathode, and that's where they hook up the negative end of the battery. And the other end over here is called the anode, and that's where they hook up the positive end of the battery. Uh, meanwhile, the inside is a vacuum tube, and it's got this nice little handy-dandy wooden stand that, so you don't electrocute yourself well, trying to hold it. Well, if it's a vacuum, why do I see something? Well, here, we should probably actually show this. Uh, oh, hmm. so there is something in there. Uh, what that guy's bringing up here is a magnet. It's bending away from the magnet. Yeah, so that light? That green light. What is that green light? Well, if that's a magnet, that's not light. Oh. But it looks like light. It does look like light. And Let's it's see if moving we can that... away. Oh, now it's moving towards. Yeah. So and away from. Depending on which side of the magnet we're holding there will depend on which way it goes. So that stuff is able to move and it must have an opposite charge to the magnet. It's moving away from or towards, depending on the side of the magnet. Right, because there's a law of electrostatics which say that opposites attract. So one of the things that Thompson concluded here... The ray is not light. Light cannot be bent by magnets. So then what is it? Right. So he's saying that the ray must have some sort of a charge, and he, he thinks that he's actually got some part of an atom flying through some sort of a metal atom that's there's metal on the ends of those uh, those cathode ray tubes so he thinks he's got some part of the metal flying through the vacuum so like particle rays particle rays exactly oh okay yeah. so, so he's got charged particle rays yeah and he since there's since it's reacting to the magnet it's got to be charged because it's uh, it's going away from the negative side of the magnet but towards the positive, positive. side so that means it's a negative charge. Uh huh. And uh, that's uh, it's uh, wow. The charges must be negative there. So uh, he figures out also that they've got mass. And the way he does this, uh, he comes up uh, he comes up with a uh, cathode ray tube that has a little paddle wheel on the inside. So okay. it's got this little paddle wheel, and as this ray of particles comes across the uh, the paddle wheel, it actually starts moving the paddle wheel around. Oh, okay, like a Ferris wheel. Right. So, and so th there's another proof that it's around. not light because light can't move. Can't do that. Yeah. All a right. Ferris so wheel. So they're actually basically what's happened here is Thompson's discovered something that's small, negative, and has mass, and he he calls it the electron. Dalton's the model must not be right. The electrons seem to be much less massive than an atom. So in other words, Dalton who th so in other words, Dalton who thought that smallest you could get, Thompson comes along and discovers that the electrons actually smaller than the atom. Thompson postulates if a negative electrons exist, then positive part of the atom must also exist. We come up with what Thompson calls the plum pudding model. And if you're British, your mouth starts salivating when I say plum pudding.
What is plum pudding, Mr. It, King? It's a dessert. It's kind of like uh, what do we? Uh, we know what rice pudding is here in uh, here in America. It's uh, it would be like rice pudding with little raisins. It's a raisins in oh, it. Oh, I love rice pudding yeah. with raisins. Yeah. His uh, his model uses Dalton's atomic model to start off with. So his model of the atom is hard and spherical. Okay. So modifications by Thomson is that the atoms are now divisible into smaller particles. He describes a large solid sphere, which is positively charged. That's that nice little yellow sphere there. And interspersed in the yellow sphere are going to be the smaller spheres that are negatively charged. He technically has, he technically has tiny spheres in one. Are the tiny little negative spheres evenly distributed throughout the large one? They should. So wait, now if that's true then, is that particle, does that particle have a net charge if it's got positives and negatives in it? Well, the whole thing here, the whole thing, if we, if we take a look at this entire thing as an atom, because there's positives and negatives equally distributed throughout, the whole charge of this is nothing. Okay. It neutralizes itself because there's an equal amount of positive charge and an equal amount of negative charge in the same area. Oh.